hear about cell phones and health. I think the issue is one that we all find a little perplexing. After all, when I first heard that there might be something wrong with uh, cell phones and health, um, about maybe nine and a half years ago, I didn't believe it. I didn't want to believe it, and I owned three phones. And I was one of those people, you know, that walked around kind of like a gunslinger, had two of them. Actually, I had three. Don't ask me why. I was directing a program then of uh, uh, a couple dozen scientists, and I was pretty obnoxious. I wanted everybody to be able to answer me right away <clears throat> and had people be wired in through the wireless radio frequency radiation. So when I first looked into the problem and I heard there could be an issue, I dismissed it entirely. After all, I said, if there was a problem, I'd know about it. You see, I'm a scientist, and I worked at the U.S. National Academy of Sciences with the best scientists in the world, and I did. Uh, and I figured if there was really a problem, I would have heard about it. I worked for President Clinton, um, and I was a political appointee, so I, again, uh, I remembered that we set up some kind of study at the time, and I learned later, as I document in my book, that that study was a bit of a sham, all $27 million of it, and that we really had very little research on cell phone safety. So I'm going to talk with you today about what I know, and the organization of my talk is very straightforward. First, I'm going to talk about what is cell phone radiation. After all, most people do not realize that a cell phone is a two-way microwave radio. Radio frequency energy is the term the cell phone industry likes to use to describe what comes out of a cell phone. But there's another phrase that describes it just as well, and that is microwave radiation. A cell phone is a two-way microwave radio. It composes special risks to children and to one of our most important organs, our brain. I'm going to review the evidence on health impacts, and I'm going to review evidence on effects on sperm, prenatal damage, effects on brain structure and function, breast cancer, increased case series risks, and head and brain tumors. Now, that's a lot to cover, and I hope you'll bear with me. I will say from the outset, Environmental Health Trust, which is the nonprofit that I've set up to try to promote understanding of this, has a website which is a work in progress. We're always looking for advice about how to improve it, but it does contain an excellent compendium of the science on this issue. And I would urge you to take a look at our website, which I'll leave you the address of at the end. And finally, I will provide you expert advice coming from experts that work for Environmental Health Trust, who include some of the top scientists in the world today, from Israel, from Brazil, France, the United States, about how to protect yourself and your family. And you'll find at the table out front this little pamphlet which provides a consensus of what we know, why we need to be concerned with respect to effects on the brain and sperm, and simple things you can do to protect yourself and your family. Of course, you should not text and drive. That's important. But most people do not realize that if they're in a car with a phone next to their head, and the car radio is not running through the car antenna in the roof, your head becomes the antenna. And each time you're moving from one cell signal to another, the phone is programmed to go to max power so you don't drop a call. Let's talk about what radiation really is. The electromagnetic spectrum runs all the way from the things that power the electricity in this room to those that you cannot see, the gamma rays, x-rays, and the like, which we clearly understand are ionizing and damaging. Ionizing meaning that they can break the DNA bonds that hold everything together in all living material. Here's where light that we can see falls, and here's where microwave radiation falls, right in this spectrum. And microwave radiation is the radiation that can damage us not by breaking DNA bonds, and not by its weak power, because it is weak. And that's what I thought when I dismissed this totally. Microwave radiation in an oven uses 2.4 
billion cycles a second at 1,000 watts of power to cook a cup of water in one minute. Microwave radiation from a cell phone could use up to 2.4 billion cycles a second at less than one watt of power. And I believed, as many scientists still do today, that because the power was so weak, the fact that the signal was the same frequency meant it had no biological effect. That belief, it's a, like a religious conviction among some physicists, is in fact not correct, and I'm going to explain to you why. Cell phones emit pulsed microwave radiation. It's the pulsed nature of the signal that is problematic. It has nothing to do with the power. The erratic pulsed nature of the signal from a cell phone that allows it to go up and down and give you information may be why it's so problematic biologically. Here's an illustration of what that pulse signal looks like. The signal has frequency, remember, between actually 800 million to 2.4 billion cycles a second. It has amplitude, it has a wavelength, and it can have information content. And the complexity of the signal is quite important to its biological effect. I will later explain to you that one of the theories, and it is a theory, of why cell phone radiation can be so damaging is that it interferes with calcium efflux. Calcium is one of the most essential things we have in any living system. And the ability of cell phone radiation to interfere with calcium may be why different forms of cell phone-like radiation are being used today to treat people with cancer by enhancing the uptake of chemotherapy through something called electroporation. Now, I'm not going to get into the details of that. Perhaps we'll have time for some discussion. But understand that the biological effect of cell phone-like radiation is really not debated by those few scientists who understand its exquisite ability to affect cells at the level of the divalent calcium ion. Now, I'm going to take questions at the end, all right? Unless you can't hear me, thank you. Um, because I have quite a lot of material I want to get through. And what I want to show you right now is this four-second phone call. During a four-second phone call, look at the change in what we call power density. That's measured as volts per meter. Meter being an area, volts being a measure, again, of power. Volts per meter varies a great deal in four seconds. You will see that the worst time to hold a phone right next to your head is when you immediately answer it. When you first answer it, it goes to max power. That's why I use something like this. And the advantage for, of this is that I can actually hear. I don't know about the rest of you, but I'm, I'm of a certain age where <clears throat> hearing is not something you take for granted any longer. And I don't think most people can hear very well with these devices. And I will ask you now, how many of you have an iPhone with you? Oh, well, uh, how many of you have your iPhones on airplane mode? Okay, I would encourage the rest of you to put it on airplane mode because then you're not transmitting. But even so, would you please, those of you who have iPhones, please take them out and go to settings. And give me a signal with your hand when you've done that, because I'm going to show you something rather interesting that you might not be aware of. While you're doing that, I'll take a moment to tell you one thing you may also not be aware of, which is that cell phone standards were set in 1997. When the average call took less than six minutes, it employed the head of a 220-pound male, and they were set to avoid heating, uh, presumably the brain, and I document in my book, Disconnect, the actual studies were done, I'm not making this up, on rats that had been deprived of food and trained to run a maze in order to get food. And they put thermometers in the rectums of the rats, and they determined how hot the rat had to get to be hungry and not try to get food. And based on that, they extrapolated to human effects. 
Now, if you're already at your cell phone, go to settings. And go to general. It doesn't matter. Airplane mode off is fine and preferable. Go to, go to general first. And then go to about, which is for many of you at the top of the screen. Right? And then go all the way down, after you've clicked on about, all the way down to the word legal, which you never knew was there. And then click on that and click on RF exposure. And you will see there written very clearly the advice to reduce RF exposure. Use a hands-free option such as that provided with the phone. And if you keep the phone close to the body, you can exceed the as-tested exposure limits, which means, gentlemen, do not keep a cell phone in your pocket when it's turned on, except on airplane mode. Uh, when it's turned off, you can do whatever you want. In airplane mode, you can do whatever you want. But the reality is there's a warning inside that phone, right? How many of you have seen it before? Well, I think that makes a very interesting point, does it not? So the standards have not been changed for 17 years. Yesterday in San Francisco, Tom Wheeler, who is now the head of the CT Federal Communications Commission, had a very rude experience at the Commonwealth Club where several people interrupted his talk to ask him what he was going to do about cell phone standards because he's the head of the FCC now, appointed by President Obama, but you see, for 10 years, he was the head of the Cell Phone Industry Association when they did the $27 million study that found nothing. Now, cell phone standards, as I said, were developed to avoid heating a heavy-set man, not a young child. And you see here the difference in scale of the child versus the man, the point being that the cell phone radiation reaches a larger proportion of the brain of a child, but also, according to studies conducted by the cell phone industry in France and in Switzerland, children's skull bone absorbs 10 times more radiation than adults. Why is this the case? A child's skull is thinner. The thinner the skull, the greater the radiation. A child's brain contains more fluid. The more fluid in an object, the faster it heats up in the microwave oven or anywhere else. Now, much of the energy from cell phone is absorbed by the brain cells in the frontal or temporal lobes. These are modeling done from our colleagues in Athens, Lucas Margaritis. These are data from Om Gandhi, who worked for years for Motorola. That work with Motorola ended the year he published these data, showing a very simple calculation that a child, a five-year-old, could absorb twice as much radiation as an adult. These are other data that he published, no longer working for Motorola, showing that the smaller the head, the greater the absorption of radiation. No surprise here. It makes sense. And yet, the size of the head for which all of the world's 6.5 billion cell phones is, are set today is that of a man who was over six feet tall and weighing well over 200 pounds, much larger than the average person in India or the average uh, young child in the world today, many of whom are using cell phones. We measure the distribution of radiation in the brain through something called the specific absorption rate. And these calculations coming from industry that I'm about to show you here show clearly that there's even a difference depending on how you hold the phone. If you hold the phone straight, you get a little different distribution than if you hold it tilted. A tilted exposure can give you a little more exposure. It depends on where the antenna is located. It depends on how you hold the phone. And the radiation also depends on your carrier. And the stronger the signal, the less radiation you get in your brain. The weaker the signal, the harder the phone is working and the more radiation it will put into you. Now, the brain grows rapidly throughout embryonic and early life. And this shows you this very simple sketch of how quickly the brain grows. 
I'm going to be sharing with you data here from a number of my colleagues. This comes from Hugh Taylor, who is the chairman of the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology at Yale University. Dr. Taylor's produced a number of important studies here, and I want to show you some of those uh, next. As, uh, as I go through the data, the most important thing I want to tell you about the developing brain is that a child's brain more than doubles in the first year of life, more than doubles. And the faster something grows, the greater the possibility that damage can take place. Radiation from the phone is absorbed into the head and body because the way phones are designed today, their antennas are either around the perimeter or on the back, and there are several different antennas for data, for internet, for voice, and half of the radiation gets into you if you hold the phone directly next to you because of the design of the antenna is symmetrical. And there's a discussion now in the industry with some of us about whether directional antennas might be better. There are ways to improve the design of phones. Industry holds patents on some of these. Whether they will use them as quickly as they might really depends on you. Why? People have to demand safer phones just as they demanded safer cars and bikes and ski helmets and motorbike helmets. And once you have the information I'm going to share with you today, I think you'll join with us to see that that process moves forward. Now I want to turn to some of the experiments with human sperm, which may explain one of the reasons for that warning that's in your iPhone. Experiments with sperm that I'm going to show you here were produced in the following way. Sperm was taken from healthy men, put into two test tubes, sperm from the same man. One test tube got exposed to cell phone radiation. The other test tube did not. It's a very clear study. This one now was done in Australia at their National Center for Research on Male Health, uh, which is led by a Cambridge University andrologist, Sir John Aitken. And what he showed is that the cell phone exposed sperm die three times faster than the control sperm that are not exposed. Now, of course, all sperm will die in a test tube after a while. And you can measure motility of sperm, how well they swim. And in terms of motility measurements, they found that, again, the sperm that were the poorest swimmers were those that were exposed to cell phone radiation. And there's a measure of uh, vitality of mitochondria of DNA, which are the engines of the cell. The mitochondria is the engine that gives the cell energy to move in the case of sperm. And mitochondrial DNA of sperm were also damaged three times more if they were exposed to cell phone radiation, indicated here and here. So clearly, cell phone radiation damages sperm. And in his uh, statistics and medicine textbook, I th edition seven, Professor Stanton Glantz of the University of California, San Francisco, has concluded, based on the data that he's amassed, that cell phone radiation clearly damages sperm count as well as sperm quality. As many of you don't read a book called Statistics in Medicine, seventh edition, I thought I would summarize it for you. Now, another study was done at the Cleveland Clinic by Ashok Agarwal, a very distinguished expert in the field and the director of the Cleveland Clinic's uh, infertility clinic. He noticed that men coming for treatment of infertility seem to be wearing, as I used to, a lot of these devices at their hips. And he did a simple cross-sectional survey. And he found that the men who used phones the most, or kept them in their pockets the longest, had the lowest sperm count. This study was published in 2008. In 2008, he was able to see that tw about 20% of men had kept phones in their pocket four hours a day. Now, of course, the numbers are much greater. And by the way, we do not have all of the answers for why sperm count has fallen. Certainly, 
the, the information Elizabeth Grossman shared with you this morning is relevant because we know a number of petrochemicals, lipophilic organochlorines, can interfere with sperm count. Those studies have been done in highly exposed workers, for example, pesticide workers. But one of the factors that can affect sperm count clearly is cell phone radiation.